Well, if you take your Bible this morning, turn over to the book of Matthew, and go to Matthew chapter 1. As you find your place in Matthew chapter 1, I have been asked by a number of folks how my voice is, and it is back, as far as I know, back about almost 100%. Uh, find out in a few minutes, I guess. Uh, but so far, we've been able to make it through the services. I, last Sunday and Wednesday, didn't know how it would turn out, but I was able to make it through, and it hurt you more than it hurt me. I mean, it didn't, I wasn't sick. It just, for some reason, my voice was attacked. But I think I'm about there. But either way, we'll see how it works out, and we'll go with uh, Matthew chapter 1 this morning. As you find your place there in Matthew chapter 1, I'll read a, a text, and we'll go back and look at a couple of these verses. So right before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you this morning that we can be in this service. We thank you for this time of year where even folks who do not know you uh, recognize the fact that you came into this world and the world's never been the same since. Well, we know that you were certainly a baby in a manger, and far before that manger, you were the eternal God and even are now. We know that we serve a risen Savior today and trust that we might use this time of year to be a, a testimony to the world as to who you really are. We pray this morning for this service that the Word of God would challenge our hearts, would cause us to focus on you, and that we might be different when we leave, and certainly than when we came in. We thank you for what you'll do this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. In Matthew chapter 1, and one of those familiar passages, of course, that we see around Christmas time, you'll notice the Bible says in verse 18 that the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost." And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Now, we don't often, at least in our culture, place a great significance on a person's name. Usually when a baby is born, a mother may hear a name that she likes or look through a, a baby book. And I don't know how it was in your family, but I know in mine, my wife had a lot more influence on the name than I did. Uh, she ran a couple by me, and maybe there was a couple I vetoed. Yeah, I couldn't do with that, but uh, she basically picked the names, and I was okay with them. And that probably happens a lot. The names are important to the, the mother many times. Now, if there's a family name, uh, perhaps a name that has been passed down, a junior and a third and a fourth and so so forth. Many times that's important. But usually names do not characterize us, but in the Bible they often did. You go back and remember in the very early days when uh, Abraham came along, his name was Abram. And God met with him and said, no longer will your name be Abram, which means high father, but now it is going to be Abraham. And he met with Jacob and said, no longer is your name going to be Jacob, which means supplanter. Now your name is going to be Israel, prince with God. And you see him telling Hosea to have a child and said, Hosea, when your child is born, you name your child Lo Ami, which means not my people. There was a message in the name. So in the mind of a, of a Hebrew who was anticipating their Messiah, certainly the name that God would give to the Messiah was significant. Now, in this case, Joseph, who is perplexed about what he's heard. He's heard that his wife-to-be, the one that he's betrothed to, that was just like a, uh, had the binding of a marriage in his day. They were waiting for that uh, day where the marriage would actually be consummated and, and he would, it would anticipate being married for the rest of his life. And the news has come that his wife-to-be is with child. He's perplexed about it, wonders what he's going to do. He's minded to just not make a public example, but to put her away privily, and an angel appears to him. The angel clears it up and says, Joseph, you need not be perplexed about this. Though the world doesn't understand it, though you perhaps have a little bit of uh, outward shame at this point, let me tell you that Mary is a pure woman, and that which is conceived of her is the Holy Ghost. And he's very careful to say, now, Joseph, you are in a unique position. He said, you are going to be uh, the earthly adoptive father of this one that's going to come, and you are going to be given a grave responsibility, and one of those first responsibilities is that you would give him his name. Now, the name was not insignificant. 
In fact, the significance of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is a significant name. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that name is above every name. It wasn't that nobody had ever been named Jesus, for Jesus and the Old Testament Joshua are synonymous. No doubt there were plenty of people that had been named Joshua, but the name Joshua, which translates over into Jesus, means Jehovah is salvation. And he said, Joseph, this is not up for uh, you to decide. This is not up for you to just to come up with, but I'm telling you, when this baby is born, name him Jesus. Now, when I consider this morning... That name, which as I said is above every name, which at the name of Jesus immediately grabs the attention, whether it be a, a attention in a positive way or attention in a negative way. That name is the causes the uh, public domain to shake. If somebody were to dare get up and offer a prayer, if they just say amen at the end of the prayer, people can live with it, but they say in Jesus' name, immediately controversy is stirred. When somebody says uh, his name, it might even be used in a, in, a, in a very flippant way, but that name is a powerful name, and there's a reason because that name is above every name. I go back and I look at Matthew chapter 1, and of course the first uh, 17 verses essentially of this chapter are taken up with a genealogy. And perhaps as you come into the book of Matthew and you read this, often you pass through that, and certainly we're not going to do a verse-by-verse verse exposition of the first 17 chapters of Matthew concerning all these names. But I believe there is a message even in this first aspect, for when we consider his name, the first thing I want you to think about is the anticipation of his name. For I go back in my mind, and I think when God met with the human race after we had sinned and we had failed him, and when Adam had eaten the fruit that he had been forbidden to eat, and God came and in their presence spoke to Satan and said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. He promised that one would come that would bruise the head of Satan. From that point, God continued to remind people and continued to prophesy that one was coming. He said, Abraham, you're going to bless the earth, but in thee all nations are going to be blessed. Your seed is going to be the blessing. The seed was speaking of this one. We could go on and look at Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10. And he, when he dealt with all the tribes, he said, now Judah, the lawgiver is going to come from you. The scepter shall never depart. You're going to be the one that will bring the seed until shallow come, but we still didn't know his name. He went on through many of familiar property, prophecies. For, uh, for instance, Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. He's called the righteous branch. He's called the son of David. He's called the morning star. He's called all the different names, but never was his earthly name revealed until right here in this chapter. Now, when I go to Matthew chapter 1, I see that people were anticipating the Messiah to come. For 400 years, a prophet had not spoken. John the Baptist has been preaching that the kingdom is imminent. People know something's about to happen. And sure enough, God sends the Messiah. Now look, if you would, to the very first verse of Matthew chapter 1. And notice the Bible says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You know, the first thing I notice here in anticipation of his name God opens up this book, the first book of the New Testament. This book that, again, uh, when you read the end of Malachi, there's a 400-year period of silence, and now it's opened up the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. It might do you well. We'll not deal with it in detail this morning to go back and note that in Genesis chapter 5, that book opens up. This is the book of the generation of the sons of Adam, and the whole theme of that book is death. And he died, and he died, and he died. Here is a book that opens up, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, and it begins with a birth, the birth of the Savior. Now, I notice that this uh, genealogy, I'm going to call it the pedigree. This is Jesus' uh, racial and royal pedigree. See, every Jew who was looking for his Messiah knew that there was something that had to be true of the one who would come. He had to be a son of Abraham, for he had to be a Jew. And he had to be the son of David, for the promise had been made both to Abraham and to David that the seed would come from them. So here we have, right begin with, in the first verse, a guarantee of who Jesus is. He is a son of David. He is a son of Abraham. But I notice not only the guarantee, I notice also the grace that is demonstrated in this list. 
Now, one thing that is very unusual about this genealogy, you know Jews were very uh, strict to keep up with their lineage. Up until 70 AD, when the temple was destroyed, all of these records had been kept. They had been carried through the captivity. They had been brought, and every Jew was interested in where he came from. So these genealogies would all be listed in a certain way, but one thing that was certainly true of all of them, they always emphasized the men. The men were named. This man begat this man, begat this man, begat this man. This genealogy is unique in that God mentions in this genealogy five women. And the women that are mentioned here remind us of the grace of God. Look, if you would, in verse 3. Now, when, Jewish, when uh, Hebrew names are translated over into Greek, they vary in their spelling, but you can recognize them. In verse 3, Judas begat Pharise, that was, of course, Judah of the tribe of Judah, and Zerah of, it says, Thamar, which is Tamar. Now, we need not go back and rehearse the story of Tamar and the shame of Judah, but there was immorality involved in the birth of the sons, and the two sons came, and Judah was their father illegitimately, and one of those sons is placed right here in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Tamar was, a, was an element. Then you continue to read, and you'll notice down in verse 5, Salmon begat Bo, Booz, which is Boaz, of Rechab, and Rechab is Rahab. Now, I don't know uh, if you'll remember the name Rahab, but in Jericho, she was the only person with enough faith to believe what God was going to do. She put a scarlet line out her window. She was known as Rahab the harlot by her lifestyle, but yet she became Rahab the righteous through coming to know God. And even though her background was wrong, her faith in God was right, and now here she is placed in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, then I read a little bit further, and I notice she, uh, 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 Booz, begat Obed of Ruth. You say, well, yes, I remember Ruth. She was a, a, a virtuous woman. Certainly, I'd expect her to see her here. We remember with great honor how she, uh, her husband died and how she did to, to get married to Boaz and so forth. But did you know Ruth was a Moabitess? Now, you say, well, what difference did it make where she was from? Moab was an enemy of Israel. Such an enemy that God said a Moabitess could not ever enter into the congregation of the Lord. They were cursed of God. Don't let them come. And yet Ruth is a Moabitess. You know what I learned when I see that God allowed a cursed race to include a woman in the genealogy of Christ? I'm reminded of this truth. You cannot curse what God has blessed. But God often blesses what has been cursed. Now her race may have been cursed, but by the grace of God... She was placed in this gene genealogy, and it reminds us of his grace. Now, one other is mentioned here in this next passage, verse 6. Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. Yes, David was a man after God's own heart, and it's too bad that we have to be reminded today of the sin in which he failed and that Bathsheba was party to that. But isn't it interesting that God allowed that ungodly union by the grace of God to come out in something positive? We're reminded that God even uses the wrath of man to praise himself. And again, the grace of God allows her to be part of this list. And then, of course, the fifth woman that's mentioned is Mary herself. So here we have a list that not only guarantees the pedigree of Jesus, it reminds us of the grace of God in this list, and then very carefully, it is a guarded list. Now we read this in our text, but look, notice closely in verse 8, uh, uh, back in verse 16. Now the whole list goes on to say, so-and-so begat so-and-so, begat so-and-so, begat so-and-so. And then verse 16, Jacob begat Joseph. And we might expect to see in the minds of some liberal theologian, and Joseph begat Jesus. But that wasn't the way it happened. It says, Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. It goes on to say, of course, that which is born in her was of the Holy Ghost. One thing about this list is God carefully guards the fact that Jesus did not just come as the result of the union between Joseph and Mary, or between Mary and any human being, but between Mary and the Spirit of God, He produced this holy seed. She was a virgin when He was born. She was not merely a young woman. She was not merely just a young girl that God chose. God says that a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and quotes that very passage in Matthew chapter 1. 
So it is a guarded thing that Jesus didn't come merely as another person who came along to be a great teacher. He is the Son of God. Now this anticipation is demonstrated in his pedigree. But this anticipation is also demonstrated in the prophecy. Let me turn you to a familiar prophecy. You can mark your place here if you want. We have Matthew 1, but go to um, Isaiah chapter 9. Now, if you didn't know much else about the book of Isaiah, chances are you've probably heard this verse. In Isaiah chapter 9, I would say about 700 years before Jesus came to this earth, God, through the prophet Isaiah, said this in verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Do you notice carefully in the wording of that verse that God says a child is born and a son is given? Now, Jesus Christ did come in the form of a child. He literally was just as much a man as if he had never been God. He's just as much God as if he'd never been man. He truly was born just like any baby was born. He came, he was in a mother's womb for nine months. He was born, of course, in a manger, and his birth was real, and he really came as a man, and thank God he did because he can be tempted at all points like as we are, yet without sin. He is a man. We needed a man to come to represent us so we could be with God. But on the other hand, it does not say a son was born because Jesus already was the Son of God. He's been the Son of God from all eternity. The Son was not born. The Son was given to us. And then it says his name. Now, you know, I've known some people with long names. I used to know a, a Hispanic guy. And we, we, one person would call him, a, um, what was it, Henry. And then somebody else called him Juan. And then somebody else called him, uh, I think, Chico or something, whatever it was. But I asked him what his name was one day. He had five names. And everyone, he said that wasn't that unusual among uh, Hispanics to have a couple of names from their parents and use both the mother's maiden name and their last name. And it was like a, a super long name. And that was impressive. I thought, man, five names. But you know, when you try to talk about the name of Jesus, it doesn't say his names shall be called. It says his name. Now, his name is Jesus, but it says that his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. That is, this person who's going to come, who we do not yet know his name in Isaiah chapter 9, many things are going to be said about that name, and they're all true. Now, that name is too, too broad, too significant to gather into one term. Many things can be said about his name. We couldn't go in deep detail this morning, but think for a moment about that list of names, which is about his one name. He's first of all going to be called Wonderful. You know, a number of years ago, a church that I'm familiar with, it's been quite a while now, a pastor was up one morning, kind of service kind of like this, and it was a little bit smaller church. They had probably 80, 100 people in the auditorium. And every uh, service, it was his uh, way, he just enjoyed doing this. He would look out. He didn't meet the people ahead of time. But if he saw a face he didn't recognize, he'd, he'd sort of talk to the people right there in the auditorium. He'd say, oh, good to have these folks here today. I don't believe I've ever met you. Where, where are you from? And so forth. And uh, this particular morning, he had a number of first-time guests. Now, I wasn't there, but he told me about this later on. He looked around, and he mentioned a couple of people, and there was a couple sitting over here, what he thought were a couple of ladies, um, it actually was a man and his wife. The man's hair was longer than his wife's. And he was, they were both, basically from their own admission, they were hippies. They came in and sat there, and of course he was just introducing people, and he totally innocently said, it's glad to, ha glad to have you two ladies here in the service this morning, <laughs> not knowing that it was a man and his wife. Well, you know, they had come that morning looking for something. They weren't really highly offended. They said later, when they, you know, he said that, they realized, well, he probably just don't realize uh, that I'm, I'm not a woman. And uh, she kept preaching along. Well, you know, that morning what happened, God worked in their heart. And I can't remember if it was that morning or the week following that the pastor visited them that they were led to Jesus Christ. Well, you know, they came back to the service a week or two later, whatever it was, 
and very recognizable this time. It was very evident when the man, he'd got a haircut and sat next to the woman and they were a new couple and they had looked a little bit different. They come the next week, they looked a little bit different and it wasn't too long, they were coming faithfully and I'm telling you, there's a place in North Carolina that you could go today where that man's been pastoring a church for 30 years since that took place. Hey, don't you know that when somebody looks back and they see a couple come in, they're looking for something, they're obviously, sin has wrecked their life, they're in the midst of a hippie movement, they hear a message about this one named Jesus and he saves them and makes them a new creature, wouldn't we have to say his name is wonderful? There's something about that name that changes people's life. Hey, he's going to be also a counselor. You know, I see somebody who's struggling with difficulties. Maybe they've got difficulty in their marriage. They've tried all the different uh, types of things. They get advice from a friend. They might even get advice from a, a professional counselor. They've tried all different avenues. They can't get any help. And finally, they turn to the book that can give them some help. And somebody who just takes uh, the Word of God and says, Look, here's some principles that God has given us. Make Jesus the head of your home. Put Him first. If you haven't received Him, get Him into your heart. Let Him change your life. And before you know it, their are home is changed around, and wouldn't they have to come and say, you know what, Jesus is the best counselor. If I can find out what he's got to say, maybe I can get straightened out. Do you know Colossians chapter 2 verse 3 says, in him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You need some counsel in your life today? Listen, I'm not throwing out all professional counseling, but a whole lot of it could be cleared up if people would listen to the wonderful counselor, the Lord Jesus Christ. In him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I might not know what to do, where to go, but if I'll trust him with all my heart, lean not to my own understanding, and all my ways acknowledge him, he's promised to direct my paths. Hey, do you know there's been a many a person who's turned to all different types of psychologists, all different types of smart folks who claim to know what's going on in life, and gotten wrong counsel? But there's been a many a simple person who didn't know a whole lot, but they listened to what Jesus said, and he led them in the right direction. He is a wonderful counselor. You know, I notice also when I read this passage, he is the mighty God. Have you ever experienced the fact that he's a mighty God? You know, there might be any number of ways that we could approach that, but imagine a person gets some terrible uh, uh, news from a doctor. I mean, the doctor tells them that they've just got months to live. They don't know what to do about it. They're perplexed about it, even if they know the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, it could be that God would allow them to go out into eternity. If they're saved, hey, they'll be better off in heaven. I understand that. But have there not been numerous times where that person has heard that terrible news? They've come back and they've shared that with their Christian friend. They've said, look, would you pray for me that if it's God's will that he might heal me? Or they've come to their church and said the, the, the prognosis is dire as far as the doctor is concerned. There's nothing there can do, but would you pray that God might do something, and they claim Jeremiah 33, 3. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And sure enough, God chooses to heal them. That's not God's will to heal in every case. He's declared in this book that we're sinners, that death is the ultimate thing because of our sin. We're going to die. That's why we need to prepare for that day. But sometimes God does intervene physically, and when He does, are we not reminded we have a mighty God? Have you ever been in a situation where you didn't know how you were going to get out of it? Hey, if you know Jesus today, aren't you glad that you had a name to turn to? Who is not just somebody that gives you solace in time of difficulty. Not just someone that you just can pray to and feel a little bit better because you've gone through a spiritual exercise, but a sovereign God that you can ask to do things that other ordinarily would not happen if you did not ask. He's a mighty God. Now, He's also an everlasting Father. Isn't it ironic that a son is given and yet his name shall be called Everlasting Father? You know, that might be a little perplexing in someone's mind. Is he a son or is he a father? You might be like the disciples in John 14 when they came to Jesus and said, uh, Jesus, I'll tell you, we just, we've been around you a long time and we, we enjoyed knowing you and we appreciate everything you have to say, but if you'll just show us the Father, that'll be sufficient for us. He said, Philip, have you been so long with me? that you don't even know me? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. He said, I and my Father are one. Hey, there's been a many a fatherless child out there who has looked for some help and the world can't give them any help. 
Hey, because of the immoral uh, lifestyle that people live today, there's all kinds of illegitimate people, uh, illegitimate kids who may be looking for help. They can't get any from the father who's not around. They can't get any from the mother who maybe has left them or forsaken them. But I'm glad I got news for someone like that. There is an everlasting father who's got help for you. Hey, he loves all and any that will come unto him. And you might not be uh, fatherless in the physical sense, but it might be the day you don't have a spiritual father. You might be like those that were around Jesus that day when he said, you're of your father, the devil. Hey, there's a better father than that. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, the everlasting father. And then it says he is the prince of peace. You know, this world's talking about peace. There's only one way peace will ever come to this world. And that is when the prince of peace sits on the throne. You know, that's not a myth. That's not a fairy tale. When, they, when Jesus had not yet come, the people doubted as to whether or not he would. And when he did, they didn't know what to do with him. Today, you've got people again who don't believe that he's going to come. But when he does, every eye shall see him. The nation shall well because of him. And those that know him are going to rejoice. He's going to sit on the throne. So when I look at that name, I realize that his pedigree, it demonstrates his guarantee. We know that he fit the, the bill. He was a son of Abraham, a son of David. We know that it definitely guarded who he was. And then when I consider this prophecy, I'm reminded about his name. But one thing I want you to notice, if you go back to our text in Matthew chapter 1, the one other thing I want you to see about his name is not only the anticipation of his name, but what about the explanation of his name? In Matthew chapter 1, we have a statement that specifically tells us why he will be named Jesus. It's very simple. He says in verse 21, She shall bring forth a son, thou shalt call his name Jesus. Now in the mind of Joseph, he knew what Jesus meant. Jehovah saves. Jehovah is salvation. He said, Joseph, you're going to name your son Jehovah is salvation. That's just like the Old Testament Joshua who took him into the promised land. He starts thinking about that name and the angel clears it up and says, Joseph, you don't have to wonder. Here's why you're going to name him that. Because he is going to save his people from their sins. Now, you know, to think that he's going to save them from their sins, to really understand the impact of that, what if Jesus had never come to save us from sin? I mean, what is the detriment of sin? You know, first of all, I think about these people that were living in that day, which of course were Jews. He came to the Jew first, specifically his people. He came there first knowing that he would save the Gentiles. But when he came to the Jew, those Jews were utterly dependent on a law. God had given them the Ten Commandments. They had taken those Ten Commandments and said, I guess if I'm going to make it to heaven, I got to keep those. He had given them actually 513 total commandments, and they were desperately thinking, boy, if I get to heaven, it's going to come from those commandments. God clearly showed them that the commandments would never get them to heaven. It simply was there to show them they couldn't make it. But in Romans 8, 3, it says, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh condemned sin in the flesh. You know what Jesus did when he came? He condemned sin. I mean, he came to put a crushing, devastating blow on sin. And there's still sin in the world. Matter of fact, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us have a heart and rebellion toward God apart from God working in it. But he came to deal with that very uh, uh, element. And he came, first of all, to deal with the person of sin. You know who that person is? None other than the devil. I'm thankful that Jesus came on this earth, walked an absolutely sinless life, demonstrated that he is who he says he is, the Christ of God. He went to a cross, and on that cross he said it is finished. And the Bible says through death he destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil. He put a devastating, knockout, crushing blow on the one who started the whole problem, the devil. The devil is a defeated foe. Oh, he still lives, he still moves. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, he knows he has but a short time. And he's working, but he's devastated. Jesus says, it is finished, it's as good as done. You know, he also dealt with the peril of sin. Is there not great problems today in this world because of one thing? Sin. You know, the Bible tells us a man reaps what he sows. We often try to analyze what is the problem. Why does this happen to me? Why do bad things take place? Often somebody gets bitter and blames them on God. No, the bottom line is 
Sin's the problem. There's peril related to sin. You know what Jesus came to do? To save us from sin. Now think about that name for a moment. You know, there's some great names throughout history. Great men with great accomplishments. Some of them are more familiar than others. You know, I think about a man like um, Alexander Graham Bell. He created the cell phone. No, it was actually the old the tel the telephone. You wouldn't even recognize what he created, or invented, I should say. He invented a telephone, changed the communication idea, and then really even your cell phone that you have today, besides playing Candy Crush and all of that, the communication idea, he came up with that concept. It's become wireless, the technology has changed, but the idea that I can put my voice in here, emulate it electronically, and let it come out over there, that has impacted this world deeply. But let me ask you, if you've ever come in despair or got depressed or wondered how you were going to get out of a tight spot or your sin has read you such a raw deal you didn't know where to turn or you've got some child who's wayward and living a life that's about to wreck them and wreck their family, have you ever thought to yourself, thank God for Alexander Graham Bell? Probably not. His name is great. He is a great inventor, but he couldn't help you in the time of need. You know, I think about a guy like uh, Eli uh, Whitley, I think it is, that created the cotton gin. Now, you got a pair of jeans today probably because he came up with that. They don't use exact technology he did, but what an impact he made. I mean, here's a great name. I'm sure during the time when cotton was selling, and boy, they could get that much more pro pro productivity out of it and make a lot less labor involved, and everybody thought, man, that's great. But I'll tell you what, has he ever helped you when you had a death and you needed solace and wonder where your loved one was going after they died? You say, well, of course not. He didn't help me in that way because he doesn't have a name like the name of Jesus. Oh, we could talk about other people. What about the name Muhammad? We could bring up that name and say, boy, he certainly impacted the world. I mean, millions, well, rather billions of people follow him. Uh, billions of people claim the writings of Muhammad and, and believe they have a great religion. What are the fruits of his religion? Well, if you follow it and closely adhere to it, you believe basically you ought to go out and kill anybody who's not a Christian or anybody who's a Christian or a Jew that doesn't believe in your God. You ought to kill them. Hey, the fruits demonstrate that that name is not a great name, but a name to be shunned. You know, I can tell you something else about Muhammad. You know what they do today? They take a pilgrimage and they go find where Muhammad was born and they also find out where he was buried. We don't worship the grave of Jesus today. We serve a risen Savior. What about the name Buddha? Hey, Buddha, you say, man, that's a great name. Influenced billions of people. Many people look to Buddha, but I wonder how many people Buddha has ever helped in the time of need. I wonder who can go to Buddha today and say, God, I don't have any assurance I'm going to go to heaven. Is there something Buddha could do? Hey, as great as that name might be in that culture, he's got a place where he's buried. He never came out of the grave, and his name is not like the name of Jesus. Hey, we could go on down the list talking about great names. People thought Alexander the Great was great, but he's dead and gone. And what good did he do? He ever helped you? But here is a name, Jesus. And that name means Savior. Hey, I'm glad that there is a legitimate, powerful, true Savior who can keep me out of hell and take away my sin. Now, that name is above all names. He dealt with the perilous side of sin. Do you know... Back in the 1800s, their smallpox hit a population and began to wipe people out. And people began to die left and right from this thing. And it became evident, what are we going to do? It was a, a great plague. And of course, some of those people remembered the uh, Black Death that had come earlier. And it wiped out a bunch of people and, and changed the whole population of, the, of Europe. So smallpox came along and people began to die and doctors couldn't help them. And they didn't know what they were going to do. There was no cure for it. And Edward Jenner, who was quite interested in trying to help these people, he analyzed it, began to study it, tried to find some way to cure it, and he couldn't cure it. But as he was noticing, the cow maids, those that dealt with the cows and milked the cows, they hardly ever died of it. He didn't know why. He began to find out that all of these cow maids had contracted not smallpox, but cowpox. And so he said, you know, they live through the cowpox, and evidently, when they get it, they're not able to get smallpox, and that's precisely what the case was. He went and studied this thing, found out that if you could give a person a very light case of the cowpox, they could get over that, give them a little fever, be over it in a day, and it would inoculate them from anything further. Absolutely changed the course 
of smallpox to the day we don't even have to be inoculated anymore. It's wiped out. It only exists in a laboratory for the most part. And yet, as great as that man was, we hardly even remember. In fact, when I, if I'd have said his name, you'd have probably thought, well, who's he? Was he the guy that was in the Olympics back in the 80s or something? Jenner? Uh, or the woman that was in the Olympics, I guess it was. Uh, but you know, that name, what a great accomplishment, is nothing beside the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know what Christmas reminds us of and ought to remind us of? Of a name that is above every name. Because that name, according to Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, is a name in which every knee shall bow, every tongue is going to confess. You don't have to be a Christian to one day recognize that name, but you'll be a whole lot better off if you are a Christian when you come to it to confess that name. So that name is above every name. May God give us a heart to honor it. Let's have a word of prayer today. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, and no one's looking around. And you know, perhaps you're here today. Maybe you don't know Christ personally. Certainly you know about him. Maybe you understand he died for you, that he rose again. But have you personally received him today? Have you received the power of that name to take away your sin? If you don't know him personally, or if you're concerned about your soul, I wonder if you'd allow me to remember you in the prayer today. You see, I'm not sure today that I have that relationship with him, but I want you to remember me in that prayer. I'm not going to point you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to come to you, but I'll pray that God will deal in your heart. If you're concerned in that way today and I could pray for you, would you slip a hand up that I might pray for you? Anyone like that at all? Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. You know, perhaps as a believer today, you know you're saved on your way to heaven. And maybe that name, though you've received it, maybe it hadn't been the place that you've been resorting. Perhaps you've forgotten that that name is the place where you can find the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace. Maybe your uh, attention has been deflected. Maybe the Spirit of God has worked in your heart in some other way this morning. But you say as a believer, I've been dealt with by the Spirit of God, and I want you to pray for me this morning. God's dealt in my heart, and there's a need. Can I remember you by a raised hand as a believer? Thank you. You may put those down. Thank you. God, we'd ask you to work in every heart this morning. You know the need. Lord, we this morning, probably most of us, would give testimony that we've received you. Lord, may we be brought back to the fact that that name is above every name. That we know the Lord Jesus Christ, who's not just a, another religious leader or a great teacher. He is the mighty God, the everlasting Father. Would you today cause us to turn to him, to resort to him, to look to him, to help us in life's need. May you get the glory in what's done, leading the invitation, we pray in Jesus' name. Let's stand with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, no one looking around. Our instruments will begin to play. If you don't know Christ this morning personally, we'd love to have someone take a Bible and show you how you could take care of that even now. I've got folks prepared who could, if you meet me here at the front, I'll have them take you aside to another room and from that place show you in the Bible how to receive Christ. You have to make the decision. During this invitation time as the instruments play, you come and you meet me here at the front while heads are bowed and we'll help someone take you to that spot and show you that. As a believer, perhaps you need to come. Find a place of prayer. Maybe there's areas that God is touching that you need to surrender to Him. Whatever the need might be this morning, if God's spoken, you come as our instruments play. Heads are bowed. If you know this song, as we start this first stanza, you sing it along with us. Have you any room for Jesus? He who bore your load of sin. As he knocks and asks at mission, Sinner, will you let him in? Room for Jesus, King of glory. Hasten now his word of aid. Swing the heart's door widely open. Be him enter while you may. 
Amen. You can look this way. We appreciate very much your being in the service this morning. We are going to meet again tonight at 6 o'clock. We're going to continue studying the book of Exodus. We just started that last week, so we hope you can be with us for that. We're going to go ahead and dismiss in prayer. And I'm going to ask Mr. Ron Schwank if he'll close us in prayer. Bless the remainder of our day in Jesus' name.